Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us for the last session of the Big Ideas for our Energy Future series. Uh, my name is Pong Liang, and I am a, a member of the Energy Futures Lab team. And I'll be hosting this session today uh, on e-mobility with, with Megan Lohman, who I will, uh, one of our fellows, uh, and who I will introduce in a moment. Uh, Emma, can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, this map is by native land is an attempt to represent traditional territories. And is one way we can acknowledge there are many ways to understand and recognize the land where we live, work and play. I know we are all dispersed in many different regions today due to the nature of our online gathering, but I encourage you to consider your connection to the place where you are. I'm currently on unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I offer this land acknowledgement to give thanks to those that have been here before me, caring for the land we all share, and hope that we can all be such good stewards for the sake of my children and future generations. This acknowledgement is also a reminder of the discriminatory, racist, and colonial practices that have had a lasting legacy and continue to create barriers for Indigenous people. Thank you. Uh, Emma, can you move to the next slide? Um, today, we will be using some technology uh, in addition to our, our Zoom platform. And if you um, uh, have a, a, a cell phone, you're welcome to use that. You're also welcome just to use the browser, um, a web browser on your computer. But if you can uh, go to and navigate to www.slido.com, and then once you get on that page, uh, there'll be a place to enter uh, a hashtag code. So just enter hashtag e-mobility and that will allow uh, for some interaction opportunity to pose questions uh, and capture questions and actually vote up and down questions. And, uh, and also we will have a, a, a few uh, polls that we would love to get your reaction to a few questions that, that we have. So once you go in there, there should be actually a, a question right away that you're welcome to uh, to answer. And the question is, if you could instantly become an expert in something, what would it be? So if you can just go to, again, go to slido.com uh, slash tag, hashtag e-mobility. And once you get there, um, there should be a little question that pops up and it give you an opportunity just to type in, yeah, type in a quick, <laughs> type in a quick answer to this question. If you could instantly become an expert in something, what would it be? Yeah, there's some good ones. Parenting certainly would be <laughs> right up there at the top of my list as well. Time management. That's great. We could all use that. Financing deployment of low carbon technology. Oh, it's a, it's a more specific one. <laughs> so we'll just give people a couple minutes um, or a minute or so just to make sure that they're able to access this and then we'll move on. Quantum electrodynamics. Oh, wow. Kind of want to ask the question what is quantum electrodynamics? But <laughs> oh, power napping. That's a good one. Okay. So, uh, so Emma, could you move on uh, to the next slide? Uh, so we just a little bit of an introduction to the our energy futures uh, or the big ideas for our energy futures series. Um, in March, 2020, so earlier this year, uh, the Energy Futures Labs Managing Director, Alison Cretney, uh, co-wrote an article on the lab, with the lab's founding partner, <coughs> uh, director, founding director, sorry, Chad Park, titled Five Big Ideas for Alberta's Energy Recovery. These ideas included hydrogen, geothermal, uh, bitumen beyond combustion, artificial intelligence, as well as lithium. The article was very well received. And in response, the Energy Futures Lab hosted two events featuring EFL fellows with expertise in these fields. Of course, there are many more big ideas shaping our energy future, which is why uh, the lab decided to extend this conversation through to October 2020 with the big, uh, sorry, with the <coughs> big ideas for energy future uh, speaker series. Uh, this is an interactive speaker series which allows participants 
um, to connect virtually with members of the EFL network. By discussing new ideas as a community, the lab sees an opportunity to encourage cross-pollination across all stakeholders in the energy system on the topic of how we can create the energy system the future requires of us, while fielding economic recovery in Alberta. Participants are encouraged to build connections, explore how various topics might be shaping Canada's collective relationship with the energy landscape. So uh, without much further ado, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Megan. Uh, so today we are really lucky, lucky to be joined by, by Megan Lohman. Megan has been working in the field of climate and energy for 15 years, uh, engaging with local government, industry, public and First Nation on innovative local solutions in response to challenges around ener energy efficiency, electric mobility and local greenhouse gas emission reduction, among a variety of other topics. She is passionate about designing and implementing high impact initiatives through effective collaboration. She believes that these projects can leverage and enhance the strengths of governments and organizations at the local and regional levels. Megan is head of community energy management for the Community Energy Association, an organization working across Western Canada to accelerate climate and energy initiatives. So without much further ado, I'll turn it over to Megan. Uh, Megan will pr provide a bit, uh, presentation uh, uh, on some of the work, great work that she's been doing uh, and through the Energy Features Lab. And there will be a, an opportunity for question and answer um, after that. As you, as you listen to Megan's presentation, if you have questions, feel free to uh, use the Slido page <clears throat> uh, to capture questions and also to, to upvote questions that you may, you may also have. So I will, I'll turn it over to you, Megan, if you have Great, thank you. Let me know. <laughs> will do. Thanks, and uh, let me just get my screen up here. All right, should be showing there, all good, Pong? Yeah. Great. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction and thanks for joining today. I know the first day after a long weekend, it's um, the list is even longer than usual. So appreciate you taking your, your lunch hour with us. Um, so as Pog mentioned, I'm a, a fellow with the Energy Futures Lab and work with the Community Energy Association. We're a, a charitable nonprofit that work across primarily Western Canada, but um, do, do work nationwide on a variety of sectors. And of course today, um, the, the topic is around electric mobility, which falls under our, our transportation uh, realm. Um, before we get started, I just thought I would recognize where I'm presenting from today. And I'm actually located in Fernie, so just across the border, which gives me lots of opportunity to work with communities across Alberta and British Columbia. And I'm in Tanaha Amakis. And uh, the Tanaha Nation, just a very quick shout out to some of the leadership they've done around e-mobility and renewable energy um, initiatives. Uh, these photos are from a, a launch event that we had when, when they revealed their, or I guess officially opened their 119 panel solar system on their government building in Cranbrook and the opening of the level two station that's connected directly to that um, to that system. So really um, excited to see that leadership and um, encouraged by, by that. Um, as well, want to explore new opportunities in communities across uh, both British Columbia and Alberta in terms of supporting First Nations and engaging in um, electric mobility and renewable energy. So the focus today, of course, e-mobility in Alberta. Um, it does exist. There are electric vehicles out there, and what we'll be talking, what I'll be talking about today, is how um, how we see the future of e-mobility in the province. This is just three examples of three uh, sites located in Alberta, um, and I'll I'll dive into that a little bit more. I want to start first, though, with just uh, reminding us about the importance of envisioning that future. And Pong mentioned Chad, a, a co-founder of. Um, the lab, um, and he says that we can't forecast our way to the future that we want. We really need to begin with the end in mind. And I really appreciate that because I um, am certainly motivated by sort of that longer term vision, visionary thinking, um, and then stepping back and grounding ourselves into what needs to happen to get there. So when um, the conversation around e-mobility was initiated at the lab, 
um, the, the topic, it seemed so big and many other fellows had lots of ideas of what we could tackle in this e-mobility space. Um, and it started out with this concept that we should establish this integrated electric mobility network across the whole province that would have load management, grid management, we'd be exploring vehicle to grid, vehicle to home, um, on-site renewable energy. And it felt exciting and really big and probably a little too much <laughs> to start tackling um, at the outset. However, a really great kind of concept of where we could go in the future. I looked at examples like in Hawaii, um, this is from their State of EVs in Hawaii document, where they're looking at just that, that idea of the future state being one that's very inter interconnected with two-way flow of energy, um, EVs uh, feeding back to the grid and renewable localized energy sources um, powering them in turn lots going on in this space and um, certainly lots of opportunity in provinces like Alberta around this but um, the importance of sort of uh, um, looking strategically at how to get to that end state is, is where I started to focus. Um, so I'll just briefly show this, uh, this image that is used often at the lab, this concept of backcasting where you do put that, that longer term uh, vision out there um, and hold that while stepping back into current um, state and figuring out the, the strategic steps that need to be taken to get to that vision. So that future state is, is that integrated e-mobility network where we've got load management and, and two-way flow of energy. Um, and we've got lots of organizations, obviously utilities, energy companies, working collaboratively um, for that optimal scenario of electric mobility in the province. But we do have to step back to today, the, the current situation and the baseline state. Um, we, of course, do have electric vehicle adoption uh, in, in Alberta, and I'll speak to that a little bit more. We've got lots of small pilots going on um, and certainly big ideas. But how we get from where we are today to where we want to be is really what this e-mobility initiative is about. It's about helping every community see themselves in that future state. And so that's what certainly I'm passionate about is bringing it down to the community level, to local governments, to individuals, um, to help uh, them see themselves in that future and contribute to the development of that future. So that's really where the focus is, where I'll speak to today. The ecosystem of electric mobility is huge. So we could dive in on policy, we could dive in on financial incentives and other mechanisms for financing, e-mobility, um, you know, education and engagement, infrastructure, electric vehicles themselves. And that's really where the first step in my mind is for communities, particularly small communities in the province, which is just getting more um, familiar with the technology, starting to see more adoption of electric vehicles locally and encouraging the travel of electric vehicles um, throughout the region through um, improved networks. So within this big ecosystem, we've really focused in on that, that element of it, supporting local, regional and province-wide um, adoption of electric vehicles and facilitating the movement of them. So when we talk about sort of our baseline scenario, what we know today, um, it may become, <laughs> may be a surprise to, to many, but Alberta is actually a leader. Alberta is a leader among provinces who have not um, had provincial incentives to date. So if we remove BC, Ontario, and Quebec from this chart of electric vehicle adoption, you can see that Alberta actually has had the highest um, rate of EV adoption among provinces that have never had um, financial incentives from the government. Of course, there's a federal incentive right now, but we're talking specific um, provincial incentives. So the first two columns just show the comparison of sales in Q1 of 2019 and Q1 of 2020. Obviously a pretty significant jump there. Um, but when we look even look annually, we can see an even greater increase over time. So at the end of, of uh, 2018, there was just over 2,000 electric vehicles on the road in Alberta. 
by the end of uh, 2019, early 2020, we were at 3,700. So this certainly doesn't capture the delivery of many Model 3s that has been happening in Alberta. We can expect that number to be significantly higher by the end of this year. The point being, though, that residents of Alberta certainly have an interest in electric vehicle technology and a propensity, perhaps, to explore and adopt new, new technologies. The issue is that a lot of that adoption, of course, is happening in the urban centres, so um, Calgary and Edmonton. A barrier to broader electric vehicle adoption, um, well, there's, there's three main ones that come up come up often, range anxiety, availability of um, diverse models, and price. Range anxiety refers to that concern of not being able to make it to the next station without running out of battery. Um, and that can be enhanced by regions that have extreme weather, so cold weather, snow, terrain, because certainly um, steeper terrain can, can uh, um, drain the battery faster, and just a simple lack of stations in those uh, regions where you wish to travel. The other two available models and price are changing rapidly just due to the natural transition of the technology. Range anxiety, though, is something that local governments and communities and organizations actually have direct influence over and through sort of creative approaches can start to tackle. It's also the reason why urban centers tend to have higher electric vehicle adoption um, because uh, really it's the only place where you're able to um, well, until now, the, it, it's the location where um, drivers can return home, charge overnight, commute in the morning, and not be concerned about that range anxiety. So it's, it's not a, um, an unfounded fear, certainly. This screenshot is from 2016, I believe, from PlugShare.com. It's a, an app that uh, maps electric vehicle charging stations worldwide. So the green dots indicate level two stations and the orange indicate level three or DC fast charging stations. Back in 2016, this is what the network looked like in Southeast um, British Columbia and uh, Southern Alberta. The cluster of green um, icons in the middle is the city of Calgary. So lots of connectivity in terms of public charging, um, some home charging there as well, um, within that urban center. And of course, as a result, the adoption of electric vehicles will be higher in that, um, in that city. When you look into the region, though, um, very little connectivity um, outside of Highway 1 in, in British Columbia. And um, certainly this hampers not just electric vehicle adoption in those rural areas, but in the city as well. Because if one cannot feel safe and um, secure in terms of a access to electric vehicle charging infrastructure, when they want to go to um, the ski hill or to visit family in another community, then the likelihood of them adopting an electric vehicle is quite low. Drivers want that reliability and the security that they're able to drive where they want to drive when they want to drive. So, of course, a huge um, region that is not going to be the um, kind of the priority, I guess, for the private sector to invest in. Certainly, we've seen a lot of leadership from Petro Canada and Electrify Canada through VW as well as Shell, who have all installed electric vehicle fast charging stations along heavily traveled corridors. It is, again, that rural area connectivity that is going to continue to hamper electric vehicle adoption um, if it's not addressed. So this just demonstrates that, that point exactly. And um, the data that, that the city of Calgary has in their EV strategy just goes to 2018, but of course that curve would continue to go up. The point being that um, there is an increase in electric vehicle adoption in the urban centers. And at the end of 2018, there were over a thousand registered just in the city of Calgary. Edmonton would look very similar. Um, what will be interesting to track over time is the impact that regional connectivity has on urban um, electric vehicle adoption. So how can this be tackled? I'll give you two quick examples before I dive into the big idea for, um, for Alberta. Accelerate Kootenays was an initiative in Southeast Alberta that our organization facilitated on behalf of the regional districts of East Kootenay, Central Kootenay, and Kootenay Boundary. So this was one of those um, bare areas on the map I showed you from PlugShare that had little connectivity to electric vehicle charging. 
all of the stations that are appearing here have actually been installed, so you can ignore the legend. <laughs> um, but through a strong collaboration and innovative funding um, opportunities, these communities um, successfully installed 13 fast chargers and over 40 level two stations to really um, significantly connect that region of British Columbia over to the Alberta border and down to the Montana border in the south. What's happened now in this uh, region is that electric vehicle adoption because of that regional connectivity and reliability of the network has gone from 22 vehicles in 2016 to over 220 vehicles today. So a huge increase in, um, in the strength of the network which has resulted in higher adoption of electric vehicles. Whoops, this one turned out to be a little fuzzy, but in southern Alberta, similar um, leadership was shown by the Regional Economic Development Association, so South Grow and Alberta Southwest, as well as the city of Calgary, Lethbridge, and Medicine Hat, all of whom collaborated to address, again, that gap in southern Alberta. So they looked to the west and saw the connectivity in British Columbia up to the border and have also been engaged with the state of Montana, who are installing an electric vehicle um, charging infrastructure network up to the, the Canadian border. And so these communities again saw an opportunity through collaboration and unique funding to address that charging gap in the south. So through this initiative, um, 20 DC fast charging and level two stations were installed in all sorts of communities where again we're unlikely to see significant private sector investment at this point, just because of the volume of, of um, electric vehicles. So now from Calgary South, there's um, a significant level of reliability in terms of the access to electric vehicle charging stations, and these communities get the co-benefits of um, hosting stations. The photo on the screen is um, a perfect example of some of the co-benefits that can result. So this is the launch of the Pincher Creek station. So we had all of our delegates there to cut the ribbon. And then a Tesla drove by um, to sort of check out the station and say hi. And so we, we asked the driver where they were from and they had come from Rosebud. So had noticed that the station was electrified. Again, it showed up on their app. And so they took the opportunity to find a bed and breakfast in Pincher Creek um, to explore some of the local amenities and activities and came down for the weekend just because of that station being sort of turned on. So really an example of that immediate um, economic benefit through tourism and, um, and again, reliable connectivity that has allowed that type of travel. So we did not plan that one. It was a total happy coincidence that this driver um, came by at the perfect time. So once um, those sort of networks were established through sort of the coordination of our um, organization with the, the local governments, through the Energy Futures Lab, we started to think a little bit bigger. And like I mentioned, initially started with that big network concept of, you know, having a fully integrated um, e-mobility network supported by smart grid infrastructure and load management. Scaled that down after lots of good coaching and conversations with the other fellows to take that first step of helping more communities across the province see themselves in that future. And so with incredible support from the EFL, we did a series of events in the northwest area of, of Alberta. Um, and sort of behind this, this uh, timeline is that is that region where um, you should be able to see that there's not very many uh, charging stations and particularly not fast charging stations. So the conversation kicked off with a couple of um, what's called roadshows and accelerators, which the Energy Futures Lab facilitated. Our organization was able to attend and start the conversation around what an e-mobility network would look like in Northwest Alberta, where, to be honest, the conversation had really um, never been initiated to this date, although electric vehicle drivers have frequently um, identified this region as a significant barrier to electric vehicle travel. So over the course of um, the last six months and through a pandemic, I might highlight, um, the communities in Northwest Alberta um, have really come together to develop a, um, a, a, the big idea of a network in Northwest Alberta. So it started out just 
just at just before the pandemic really <laughs> ramped up with an in-person meeting in, uh, in Drayton Valley where that big vision was put down on paper. So everyone grabbed their markers and pens and mapped out what could this possibly look like for Northwest Alberta? What are the innovative opportunities, the co-benefits and the values that we want to communicate through the development of this e-mobility network? And so this was a really exciting initial conversation. And again, just at the beginning of March of this year, Partners were starting to be identified, um, opportunities to leverage other initiatives were identified, and sort of that bigger thinking of different types of routes. So you can see pipelines on there, you can see industry routes, you can see um, rail, and, uh, and even some recreation opportunities. So lots of big thinking happening at this workshop. What was clear was that the communities recognized that there were a lot of local opportunities that would um, that that could come to fruition through this type of initiative. Electric vehicle tourism, like I mentioned, this area has traditionally been a bit of a barrier to EV travel because of the lack of infrastructure. Economic diversification as a result of that tourism, local capacity building, so an opportunity to retrain or upskill um, industry and trades and contractors for the installation and operations and maintenance of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, a new way to brand or market the region, so one that, again, would attract more uh, tourists um, uh, from the sort of recreational lens. And then really an opportunity to demonstrate leadership. So all of this was discussed through what became a series of online <laughs> workshops with the communities, um, again, with uh, facilitation from the Energy Futures Lab. It's a little fuzzy again, but what, what we began to see was a, a real core um, of leadership starting to emerge in Northwest Alberta and a desire to demonstrate um, the opportunity that exists in this region, um, one that's rural, one that uh, is quite sparse in terms of um, the distance between the communities, and one that is traditionally focused, of course, on oil and gas industry. This was an opportunity to diversify in all sorts of ways. So these are the, the seven um, organizations in the region that have come together to really create that strong advisory committee supported by myself and my colleague Danielle, who I believe is also on this call from CEA to um, establish what that network is going to look like and how we're going to start to facilitate all of those um, co-benefits in the region. So what has become of it is, um, is an initiative called eVenture. And eVenture is going to um, effectively map out and um, fund a series of um, electric vehicle charging stations across the northwest region of Alberta, connecting to um, networks that have already been established in British Columbia um, and along the Highway 2 corridor south in Alberta. So this is very preliminary, so don't, uh, no promises on, on the icons that are on this, um, this map, but these are some of the initial ideas of where communities are seeing opportunity um, to enhance local economic development through electric vehicle tourism and connectivity. So you can see the gray dots actually do demonstrate where there's a pretty robust network connecting um, the urban centers in, in Alberta, um, as well as along the, uh, the British Columbia border. So I just want to come back to this um, backcasting approach and reiterate that importance of, of holding that, that vision of that future state. We hope that through this project, we can start to integrate some of those innovative ideas in a very micropilot approach. We've already um, begun to look at opportunities like uh, recreational electric. Um, recreational vehicle electrification. So there is actually a dealer of Tega's electric snowmobile in Edmonton. So what an opportunity to perhaps test that technology in the Northwest region of Alberta. Um, there's also other fellows working on initiatives like um, uh, solar, residential solar and load management. And so opportunities again to cross pollinate across um, other initiatives that are exploring what this future state could look like. And then, of course, um, centering that in where we are today and helping the community see themselves in the solution um, that is possible in the future. 
I think I'm going to uh, wrap it up there just a couple minutes <laughs> short, but um, hopefully that provides a bit more time uh, for conversation. But thank you again for the opportunity to share the story about e-mobility in Alberta. Uh, thank you very much, Megan. That was wonderful. Um, thank you very much for that great overview of the work that you've been doing and, and also the situation um, in Alberta. So now is an opportunity for, uh, for Q&A. So again, I, I invite you to go to uh, slido.com and uh, the hashtag is eMobility. And, uh, and please feel free to just add questions that you may have um, on there. And you're also welcome to upvote and downvote uh, questions as, you know, as, as, they, um, as they appear. So actually there seems to be just one uh, clarifying question uh, for DCFC. So maybe maybe you can just help, help out with that. There. Sure. So, um... Apologies for the um, acronym. It's direct current fast charging. So that's um, sort of the yeah the, the faster charging station. So they require three phase power, tend to be at minimum fifty kilowatt charging stations, and um, that is that's what's been traditionally installed across um, Canada, really, with manufacturer manufacturers. Um, producing higher powered stations. Um, certainly Teslas are, are already um, higher powered than, than the 50 kilowatt. Um, I believe Petrocans are at least 100 kilowatt stations. So again, that, that faster charge opportunity. Um, and Electrify Canada, as I, I understand it, are again meant to be even, um, even faster. So there's an evolution in the technology ongoing right now. Great, thank you. Um... The, there is a, uh, I'm not sure if there's someone put TY there. I don't know if that's a, a question, but. I think that's like, thank you. Oh, okay, <laughs> Another acronym. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. someone upvoted it. Like, okay, that's great. Uh, um, so there is a question here about a bridge technology. So it says, why is there so much resistance to bridge technologies? Um, that is to say, small onboard gas generator to provide heat and extend range, reducing battery demand. Yeah, well, yeah, so I think um, the technology there is the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So that's where you've got the gas um, engine and electric um, engine. Um, I'm not sure there's resistance, really. Uh, the, the Mitsubishi plug-in hybrid is actually one of um, Canada's best-selling, if not the best-selling now, plug-in hybrid vehicle um, because of its size. It's a bit more of a crossover SUV. Um, we've driven that uh, as part of, of our work um, previously, and certainly that extended range, especially in areas without um, charging infrastructure or with limited charging infrastructure, um, is a much more reliable <laughs> option for sure, um, and certainly for, for that providing heat as well. Um, I guess, I mean, personally, uh, I'd love to see uh, the technology in um, pure electric or battery electric vehicles to be um, such that, that you can drive the same distance as a gas or a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, um, primarily because of the simplicity of the vehicle. So uh, a plug-in hybrid does, of course, have all of the components and mechanisms of a gas vehicle as well as an electric engine. Um, electric battery electric vehicles have significantly less moving parts, um, significantly less mechanical and uh, maintenance costs associated with them. But with that, right now, there are, of course, limitations. We'll see um, trucks come onto the market, uh, F-150, Ford F-150 expected, I believe, next summer. I'm sure you've all seen Tesla's Cybertruck. <laughs> There's some uh, startup companies, Rivian being one of them um, in the US that are starting to develop um, battery electric trucks um, and SUVs that probably appeal to to a larger part of the the market um, so yeah I, I think it's a it's a transition and, and certainly the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles um, especially if you're able to uh, plug in at home and, and charge the battery to maximize um, its use um, is certainly an option Great, uh, thanks Megan. Um, there seems, well, there's a, a comment here. It's sort of a question, sort of comment. It says, this seems like an opportunity well in line for distributed micro power generation. Uh, mm -hmm. Mark, uh, very interesting discussion. Do you have uh, thoughts or comments that you wanna? Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that that's something, you know, we're seeing um, the discussion around um, 
end of life batteries from electric vehicles. So uh, the batteries that can no longer facilitate um, driving are actually being repurposed for uh, residential scale renewable energy. So what an opportunity to have a sort of a second life for the, the batteries for that distributed micro or, or um, on building power generation. Um, certainly when vehicle to grid or vehicle to home technology is, is um, more broadly available with the vehicles, again, that'll be an interesting evolution, the ability to perhaps charge a, um, to, to draw power from your, your solar panel or feedback to your home um, through a battery would be such a, um, an innovative uh, technology for that sort of distributed energy opportunity. Great, thanks, Vinny. Um, there's a, a question here that uh, reads, what are some of the main reasons that communities are developing these networks, in particular during uh, the COVID pandemic? Like you had mentioned mm -hmm. benefits, um, yeah. Like what, 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 what strikes you as like uh, the opportunity now to move that, that these communities are, are looking at? Yeah, well, certainly in the Northwest, there was a lot of discussion around sort of this as an opportunity for some recovery opportunities. So looking, you know, to, to when it, the network is established and being able to facilitate uh, more tourism um, is just another opportunity for economic diversification in that region. Um, to be honest, there's also a lot of money coming out of uh, government, um, federal government in particular, for the investment in uh, green recovery and specifically electric vehicle um, uh, network development. So there's been um, several grant opportunities, funding opportunities that have opened over the past um, couple of months that really helped to um, make, make a, a very strong case, I guess, for um, for investment in in this type of network. Great, thanks for you. Uh, so there's a th bit of a uh, different question here. So it says EVs are obviously better for carbon emissions. How do you respond to those that claim life cycle impacts of electric cars are worse due to bad due due to the battery materials? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, when you so there's been a study done. Um, I think it was Simon Fraser University, although I can I can get the the proper information and send it out to everyone um, about that life cycle cost of um, got, um, internal combustion engine versus electric vehicle, and certainly at the end of the electric vehicle life cycle, there is a, a spike in terms of the um, the impacts, but overall it, it is less than an internal combustion engine. In terms of the the battery materials. Um, Actually, through the lab, I had the opportunity to um, to facilitate a discussion at a lithium uh, conference that happened in Calgary last year. And what I learned was that the expectation is that many of the, the minerals um, that are used in electric vehicle batteries are likely to have the same trajectory as, for example, lead in, in standard batteries that, that you and I have in our vehicles and our gas vehicles right now, um, in that we can expect up to sort of that 98, 99% recycling of, of those components of the batteries. Um, the trajectory for lithium, for example, is very similar. On top of that, there's some unique opportunities, again, um, in Alberta with um, lithium recovery from uh, and Pong can speak probably more eloquently to this as it is a, another fellow's initiative, but um, yeah, extracting lithium from um, from the uh the, the water the, yeah the water the from the water. oil and gas processing <laughs> yeah so um lots of i think unique opportunities to look at domestic um access to some of these minerals and uh, materials used in batteries and i think a lot of opportunity um for the reuse of the batteries at their usable end of life for for driving again like i mentioned for that renewable um application Great, thanks, Wayne. Um, so there, another question here. Uh, what are the top three factors that favor fast charging stations versus older technology? Hmm. And I guess in terms of older, maybe that's just referring to like level two stations, which um, there are um, benefits to both. So I wouldn't say that uh, fast charging is favored, um, for example, in car parks in downtown Calgary um, 
it would not be an effective use of money to install a bunch of fast charging to accommodate sort of that longer term parking scenario. Uh, level two stations are completely appropriate for that um, situation. It's more of that um, application for fast charging is, is suitable for um, regional travel and um, sort of the stop and stop and top up type scenarios similar to, to current um, gas stations. So we'd, we'd want to see that um, level two infrastructure is still being invested in and installed where appropriate. So at locations that tend to hold people longer. Uh, workplaces, of course, home um, charging is level two technology. Um, uh, recreation centers, malls, that sort of thing tends to uh, be appropriate applications for, for level two or slightly slower um, charging infrastructure. In terms of that super fast um, charging opportunities, uh, again, trying to make the experience more like a gas vehicle where you're topping up for a few minutes as opposed to say an hour um, on a I'll use the Chevrolet Bolt, I drive that as an example in a minus five day it might take me an hour to get from zero to, to 80%. Um, and so of course, manufacturers are seeking to have an experience that's going to be more convenient and more akin to gas refueling. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so the next question reads, what do you find is some of the challenges to collaboration between communities and how can we overcome them? It's an interesting one because it's not, um, the approach that I've taken in the networks that I've been involved in has never been to sort of force a collaboration. It's been to present an idea and a concept. And if the communities feel that it's their priority um, or, or a priority that they would like to, to further, then the collaboration is, is quite a natural one. Um, so I can't say that I've had um, you know, a challenge in forcing people to get along because that's just not been the approach that I've taken. I think um, there's been enough positive demonstrations and leadership shown by collaborative um, approaches in other regions that it's starting to just happen organically. So when we did the Accelerate Kootenays um, South, Southeast uh, British Columbia initiative, it was actually um, uh, the folks in Southern Alberta that came knocking on the door of the mayor actually of Fernie to say, hey, how'd you guys do this? We wanna do the same. And then similarly, Northwest Alberta, um, MD of Greenview kind of looked to the South and said, hmm, that's an interesting approach to tackling a problem that on our own would be prohibitive in terms of capacity and cost and um, the whole thing. So I think that there's sort of a, a natural evolution happening here in terms of these um, regions recognizing the value of, um, of collaboration. Great, thank you, Megan. Uh, so next one's a quick one. It just asks if your slides are available online or, or I don't know if we're sharing them afterwards, but uh, maybe someone can pop, pop in and provide a little bit. I think we will, they will be. <laughs> it's recorded anyway on, yeah. yeah. So we'll see, well, there may be a link that uh, for all the people who registered, at least with the recording um, and maybe with the slides. So we'll come back to you on that. Uh, so the next question reads, um, has there been any contact with communities that have installed solar panels to encourage them to add charging stations uh, as well? Um, yeah, not, not um, intentionally, uh, sort of as a targeted outreach to communities that have, that have done so. Um, but happy to hear from any communities that want to look at integrating EV charging into solar installations or as a demonstration um, project. So that certainly was a, a big emphasis for um, the Accelerate Kootenays Network. Many of the, the sites were actually co-located with um, solar in order to sort of draw that link between where our energy comes from and how we're using it. And the Tanaha Nation example was, was one of those. Um, but it's certainly, yeah, it's an opportunity and, and happy to hear from any communities that would like to explore it further. Great, um, thank you. Uh, and then uh, another one here, another carbon related one. For, for places where electricity is generated using fossil fuels, how does that tie into EV use? Uh, that is to say, in considering emissions, does it still make sense to own, a, own an EV? Yes, for sure. So um, there's, yeah, there's been multiple studies done on this, actually comparing the greenhouse gas um, impact of electric vehicle use in 
BC versus Alberta versus Ontario, all of which have different grid composition. And in the end, um, electric vehicle compared to internal combustion engine is um, at least 30% better in terms of um, tail tailpipe <laughs> emissions um, in Alberta. So despite the, you know, the, the coal content on the, on the grid um, or fossil fuel content generally, um, there's enough of uh, efficiencies gained through just the electric motor, um, as well as just that, that mixed composition. There is quite a bit of renewables in the Alberta grid as well. Um, so the end result is a lower greenhouse gas impact compared to internal combustion, even with that um, carbon content. Great, thanks, Megan. Uh, and yeah, the last question we have here is uh, just asking about case studies, actually. It says, could you share uh, info slash case studies regarding, or study, uh, studies, uh, cases <laughs> regarding retrofitting batteries for household applications? Yeah, so um, California is actually the jurisdiction where I've read the most about um, this sort of reusing of, of um, battery vehicles for, on-site uh, renewable energy storage. Um, I, off the top of my head, I can't like tell you studies, but if you want to get in touch, um, I'd be happy to share the resources that I have. And I think it's an exciting um, and evolving area of work. We have actually in Alberta quite a few um, battery manufacturing um, and energy storage companies that um, this, this could be an interesting opportunity for. We also have um, just across the border in BC, in Trail, North America's only, um, uh, or second, I think, only um, uh, battery recycling facility um, that actually can break down the component parts of, of these types of batteries. So again, I think it's a, an emerging opportunity for the reuse of the, uh, the EV batteries. Great. Anyway, happy to share um, specific information on that. Great. Thank yeah. you very much, uh, Megan. Uh, so th let's move over to, uh, Emma, can we move to the next slide? We'll move over to the um, couple of polling, poll questions. So uh, you've had an opportunity to ask Megan questions, but we also wanted to uh, ask you, the audience and participants, a few, just a few quick questions regarding this topic. Uh, so this will just take a few minutes. Uh, so the first question is, how desirable is the is e-mobility for Canada's energy future in your mind? How desirable? Okay, so we'll just give it. Again, if um, to answer the poll, uh, just go to slido.com on your phone or uh, on, on a web browser on your computer. And then when you get there, just uh, use the hashtag eMobility. And, uh, and then this poll should just pop up on your screen. And you can just, it's just a quick, uh, quick click. So I'll just give another 20 seconds or so for people to, to find that. So overall, it seems to feel it's very desirable. Okay. Uh, so we're just going to be curious to, to know why. So that's actually the next question. So uh, whatever you rated, desirable or somewhat desirable, uh, or other perspective that you have, um, yeah, you could just take a moment just to type in, well, why is that? Why is it highly desirable? Why is it? somewhat desirable, you know, what, uh, what's, um, or if you think it's not desirable, that's also uh, great to know why. So what, why, why would that be? Lower emissions, improved driving experience, hashtag climate emergency. Cleaner distributed energy generation is a cleaner match for distributed use. <laughs> Why is this even a choice? It's an imperative.
way for the individual consumers to be part of the transition and improve the energy system. Another one around lower emissions, lower greenhouse gas emissions. So again, just another 10 seconds if you love to hear your thoughts. Even if they've been said, it's always nice to see what themes are emerging. Limiting fossil fuel and use elements. It's less practical due to Canada's large footprint, but lots of great info in this presentation to bypass those concerns. <laughs> great, thank you. Uh, and then, and then so, uh, Emma, can we move on to the, the next one? So this is a, just a quick one here. Um, do you see EVs as part of your future? So if you already have one, click that. Yes, that will be when you know, you're planning to. Maybe, you know, like if something comes up that better suits your needs or, or not at all, you don't see that at all in your future. It's a lot of people planning to. We're going to have to improve the supply in Alberta as a result. <laughs> that is another limiting factor. <laughs> well, there's, there's definitely a lot of people planning, planning to. Uh, so again, just another 10 seconds and then we'll move on to this the last, uh, the last one. Uh, Emma, can you just move to the, the last question? So the, just the question is, what, you know, why, why do you select this answer? So yes, if you're planning to, why is that just from your own personal perspective? If, if there was a maybe, well, why is that a maybe? What, you know, kind of what, what hesitations, uh, what do you, you know, what, what would change that answer, you know, for you, what, what you kind of, what are you looking for? Or if it's a no, then it'd be under great to just to really understand, well, why you think that's not, not in your future. <laughs> they are fast. <laughs> I think like many of you have I've had an opportunity to uh to ride in a Tesla and experience the, the acceleration. <laughs> I want to lower my greenhouse gas emissions. I also think the cars are more appealing because I won't have to visit the gas station again. <laughs> I wanted to lower my carbon footprint and they are fast. Transport sovereignty, oh, yeah. so convenient to charge at home. So there's convenience of it as well. Cost is a factor in size, big enough for my large family and all the gear. Can't wait to make the transition though, especially for commuting. So just again, just another 10 seconds if you to, to Type in your answer and hit the return button and then, and then we'll wrap up. Hmm, that's a nice one. For my grandchildren and her family's future. Great, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, Emma, can you just move to the, I guess, the last slide? So uh, that concludes the session for today. I uh, wanted just to give a big thank you to, to Megan for, for joining us. So thank you very much again, Megan. And also there's a couple of people here behind the scenes, uh, Emma uh, and Kelly. Uh, thank you very much for uh, moving the slides and setting up the poll. So thank you very much for that. And, and thanks to all of you for joining us. If you are interested in learning more about the Energy Features Lab and the various initiatives, uh, people, partners that we have involved, uh, there's some links there that you're welcome to follow in, in some of the, our major, the major uh, social media platforms. And then also on the bottom there, there's uh, a link to our, our website, www.energyfutureslab.com, where you can find more information uh, about the work that we do. Uh, and I think that is it. Uh, so thanks again, Megan. <laughs> uh, and Thank thanks you. again, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day and enjoy your week. <laughs>